chords. All right, so uh, I'm here with my friend Patty, um, and uh, we both have read the same book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score by uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kerk. And, um, and I read it a while back, uh, a couple years ago, um, and she just finished reading it. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to have this conversation with her and um, kind of talk about how we are applying this in our lives. Um, but first, um, uh, Patty, uh, you not only have some experience with um, trauma and abuse in the past, but um, as an adult, uh, besides all of your work career, um, mm -hmm. uh, you have become an ultra runner. And, <laughs> um, and I think that's like been, played a, a role a little bit in your um, uh, healing or um, mm -hmm. coping and processing and, and all of those mm -hmm. things. But um, tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and what you do, and then um, maybe some of the races that you've done. Okay. Um, well, I, um, yeah, I started running um, about, well, now it's been about 26 years, and um, it's always been, like you said, a really a source of healing for me. Um, and, um, just throughout, throughout my life, I've always liked the running portion of any sport that I was playing like soccer. I played midfield, so I was running and anytime a PE teacher told us to go out and run, I was like, yes, yes, I want to do this. And, um, and, uh, I do talk about running a lot. Like when people ask me, oh, tell me about yourself, I think immediately the runner in me um, because it just encompasses so much of me more than my work and I don't have a lot of other activities but um, more than my work and other interests and things like that I just like immediately am drawn to describing myself as a runner and um, as of about 10 years ago an ultra runner <laughs> That's so cool. So yeah, um, uh, what are some of the distances that you run regularly in practice? And then uh, what are the, some of the races distances that you've run? Yeah, um, well, like a lot of people, I started with 5Ks. Uh, I ran cross country in college and um, that wasn't enough mileage for me. So uh, I, then I went to like 10Ks and then half marathons. And then, um, then I ran my first marathon in, uh, I think it was around 2002. And um, I ran that after a really, really difficult period of my life. And um, I even get emotional talking about my first marathon <laughs> because um, it was, you know, I crossed the finish line I, I knew I was going to finish the race. I knew physically I was going to be able to do it uh, just because of my training and my experience and, and all of that. But um, I wasn't prepared for the emotional aspect of finishing the marathon. And um, it just, it just almost to my foundation of who I am just completely changed the trajectory of my life. And um, not to say that my life has been, you know, super easy since then, but it gave me like this strength that I had never known. I mean, especially as a child, I never knew I had that strength until I crossed that finish line. And people say, you know, it changes your life and it does, it does. When you, when you finish your first marathon, um, I just, it was an extraordinary experience and I wanted more of it. <laughs> cool. So I've run a, a lot of marathons. I've run about 20 marathons. And then I heard about 
this thing called an ultra marathon of people running 50, 100 miles. And I, I was like a lot of people, I thought I didn't know humans could go that far. And, um, but once I heard about it and once I read stories of people just like me, just ordinary people uh, finishing these ultra marathons, I thought I, I wanna be a part of that. And so my first race, I started with a 50 miler and um, go big or go home, I guess. Yeah. And um, cause ultras usually start at 31 miles. A 50 K is kind of the, the shortest ultra you'll find. Um, and uh, so I started with a 50 miler and I absolutely loved it. Um, I, it, it was interesting when I finished, when I crossed the finish line of my first 50 miler, um, it wasn't like my marathon. As far, I don't think it was as far as growth and things like that, um, emotional growth, I guess. But uh, I, I was almost in disbelief. Like I kept looking at my watch and, you know, the race director said, congratulations, you finished. And I'm like, I couldn't have run. I couldn't have done that. And uh, so I was just like in shock that I had run 50 miles. That's and um, yeah, I just, um, and what was funny is uh, I was pretty fit when I was training for it. And um, I didn't have the same experience a lot of people have. I, I got to mile 30 and I just, I ran. I ran the last 20 miles faster than I ran the first 20 miles because <laughs> I was so excited. Cool. I'm like, at one point I knew I was going to finish. And so I just like took off <laughs> and finished the race. But yeah, I've done a lot of ultras now and um, I've attempted hundred miles, um, but I haven't quite finished. Um, but I'd have to say my most challenging race is called the Bigfoot. I did the 40 miler. There's actually a 200 miler. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but I did the 43 miler and that was my most challenging race because of the terrain. You run around Mount St. Helens. Hmm. And so there was a lot more climbing up hills than I was used to. And there was, I mean, all sorts of things, stream crossings, there was this rope climb and you're like climbing over boulder fields. And it was, it was an adventure more than it was like a race. Yeah, wow. And right around mile 34-ish, a huge storm just, just descended on all the runners. Wow. It was like thunder and lightning and rain and we could hardly see because it was dark. We couldn't see where we were going, um, but it was just an experience of a, of a lifetime. And um, I'm, it's, I'll never forget it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, wow, that's so cool. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, so I've talked to quite a few people who um, have utilized some sort of fitness and everyone mm -hmm. kind of has something that they gravitate toward, whether it's the water or running or lifting or a sport, um, mm -hmm. yoga, um, and all of that is, is very healing and, and, uh, nourishing and helps mm -hmm. us get back into our bodies, uh, and out of our minds, which we, when we're in survival mode or uh, mm -hmm. we get triggered or traumatized. Uh, we tend to go up into the mind and, right. um, look for danger and, uh, micromanage the body and the, the human experience. And, mm -hmm. um, and that w was one of the things I remember, um, from the book, the body keeps the score. When I listened to it, it was a few years ago, I was in Michigan and, uh, I listened to a lot of books on audible. And so, um, uh, on the road and prepping meals and my own workouts, I would listen to the book. And mm -hmm. um, I just remember, like, I, I don't remember a lot of details now because it's been a few years. Yeah. But um, at times things will come back to me and, and I'll sure. like, oh yeah, that was in that book. And, and I do remember that it was challenging and reassuring mm -hmm. listening to the book because right. 
it validated a ton of things that I experienced and really made me realize even more the intensity of what I went through. Right. Um, but, but also it was really hard to listen to as well. And mm -hmm. so, um, I would have to like put it down for a while and then yeah. come back to it. And I actually never quite finished it. Mm -hmm. I got through most of it, but, um, just because it was like overwhelming to listen to, Yeah. but yeah. that is one of the things that I remember was that, um, and I've learned more about this since, but he, he was saying as the world's foremost PTSD expert, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, he was saying that he's never seen anything more um, beneficial for healing than mm -hmm. yoga. And he uses that specific example. Right. And as a personal trainer and as, as someone who's worked with a ton of different people, I think different types of activity and movement can be that thing that helps mm -hmm. people get back into their body. It's mm -hmm. whatever like feeds them. Some people love the yoga and some people just can't sit still or it's too quiet for them and so they need yeah. something different and but different things allow people to get back into their body mm -hmm. so either starting with that or just kind of what were some what are some of the highlights for you uh with that as you well i think book? um yeah i think first off when i started reading so the you might remember but the beginning of the book is a lot of the actual science of trauma and the brain and your body and you know what's happening to in certain brain structures and and all of that um but yeah i i read a lot about the the yoga there was almost an entire chapter devoted to yoga and um i have tried yoga <laughs> um but i think um I think what the book did in terms of like my running is um, it made me really think about, so when I was young, in my early twenties, I struggled with anorexia and um, that's actually like a disconnection from your body, even though it seems like you're hyper-focused on your body when you have an eating disorder. I think it's so different. I think you're just really disconnected from it. And um, I think that part of the book was really transformational for me because um, I realized that um, how, how uh, my trauma was first related to my eating disorder. And um, cause I did experience some sexual trauma and there's a strong correlation between sexual trauma as a child and eating disorders. Um, I don't know what the numbers are or anything, but um, that was definitely true for me. Um, and with the, the running actually helped me heal from the eating disorder, strangely, um, because it, it turned into more of something I was trying to control. I mean, eating disorders are a lot about control or you think you're having control over your body when really you're kind of out of control in a way, in a sense. And when I started running, um, it became more about what my body could do um, and finding all these little, I always call it nooks and crannies of strength that I found in running. Mm. And gradually it became less about the weight on the scale and what my body looked like and the constant, I think they still call it body checking, you know, constantly looking in the mirror. And it became more about how I felt. Um, so I was connecting mm. with my feelings and my emotions through running that I couldn't do and anything else that I was doing. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, that part of the book, when they were talking about that connection was, I had to do the same thing you were saying. I had to put the book down often if it got too intense um, because it, it would, I don't know if it triggered your PTSD at all, but there were certain sections where something was really, that I really connected with and was really poignant and I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta step away um, and kind of um, ground myself and, and 
kind of reconnect. Um, but yeah, the um, I think the connection between my running and what I was reading in the book was just, it was like the author was reading my mind. It's like they're talking specifically to you and like they like they know, the author knows what your experience was. It was really, really fascinating. Yeah, that's really cool. And I loved how, um, how you had that kind of gradual transition from um, kind of micromanaging your body and right. punishing it and yeah. uh, disciplining it right. to, um, to picking up running. And like, I know like a, a part of you in the beginning knew that running was good for you. And mm -hmm. so there was a little bit of self-care, but probably a little bit of punishment as well. Yeah. Um, and people can, can definitely use exercise as punishment, mm -hmm. um, where they're still disconnected from their body and they're separate from right. their body and like punishing their body. But yeah. I love the way that you said that when you started connecting to how good you felt mm -hmm. running, like there, there was the switch because yeah. you're no longer in your head driving yourself. Mm -hmm. but you're in your body feeling it right and it right. felt good and so then things switched to like food became more of a fuel source right so that you could have that good feeling yeah of running and connecting to your body and right. that expression that being alive that uh, mm -hmm. knowing what it feels like to live right and um yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was funny. I think, um, I, along with the running with my eating disorder, I, um, like I'd be at dinner parties and I, it's, it's so amazing how this changed my whole perception of eating, but I would go to these dinner parties and dinner parties for someone with an eating disorder is like terrifying, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. And, um, but I watched uh, the other people eating. I was observing and trying to take in their energy at the dinner party, which I tend to do a lot. Um, and, but I would watch primarily the women and I saw that they enjoyed food and that they talked about food in terms of flavor and texture and wanting to try new foods and being excited about it and dinner parties are very social and um i was just watching them and i i, I thought i was on another planet because there was no like body shaming there was no negative like you know sometimes in families at thanksgiving or whatever we turn a lot of the things into a negative like oh my gosh i'm gonna have to burn all of this off tomorrow or you know i'm gonna gain 10 pounds overnight and it always kind of reverts back to, again, what your body looks like. And, but at these dinner parties, there was none of that. And I just, over time, I thought, you know, there's a whole world of people out there that don't count calories. They don't obsess over, you know, their macros and um, their, the amount of body fat on their, on their bodies and the weight they just eat and they enjoy food. And these, the women at the dinner parties, they were all different sizes, you know, just different normal bodies. And, um, and I remember one specific uh, comment at one of the dinner parties, I was seating there and it was like uh, dessert time. And uh, no, I do not eat <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the time dessert was not an option and uh, but I had run like 10 miles that day so I remember sitting next to this woman and I said well I guess I could eat dessert I did run 10 miles and she said well I didn't run 10 miles today but I'm still eating dessert yeah and I remember like turning and looking at her like that's impossible you can't eat dessert if you didn't run 10 miles yeah. um, <laughs> But it was just such a huge learning experience for me. And I just wanted to be a part of that. I, I wanted to be a part of the people that, you know, their whole life wasn't wrapped around their body. And yeah. um, 
certainly I, I think you and I both agree it's important to take care of your body and and nourish it with good foods and and all of that but um, there's a difference between that and punishing yourself for totally. food or or whatever and um yeah so yeah. thank goodness for dinner parties <laughs> that's so cool was this just a friend circle that you uh were in yeah. at the time yeah, um, wow. I was in a relationship at the time with somebody who was very social and had a lot of friends and um, they had these dinner parties and mm. um, yeah, 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 so. That's, that's cool, it's, yeah, I like that kind of revelation mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that you were able to have at this yeah. um, setting. And I, I think that um, uh, sometimes we do get stuck in our own world especially mm -hmm. if we've experienced some kind of trauma right? Um, and it can really be helpful to have someone spell things out mm -hmm. for us yeah. right. in that way. Like not that they were intending to, but they spoke clearly and right. just like chose their reality clearly. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you were able to witness that and kind of grasp it. So that's really cool. Also that you, um, have continued to uh, run and mm -hmm. to take care of your body in a yeah. in a healthy way uh, and to nourish right. yourself. But um, you learned that you don't have to obsess or micromanage or uh, right. like that your worth is not tied up in um, like having zero body fat or, right. or <laughs> right. you know, eating perfectly healthy or whatever, all those yeah. things. Because uh, yeah. we have so many assumptions and associations yeah. yeah and the book talks about um having you know when you've experienced trauma you there's still that um um hyper vigilance and that is also connected to like um sensations in your body and you i don't know if you experience the same thing but you just kind of keep yourself very rigid mm -hmm. because if you can keep yourself rigid and in one place and all yeah. in one piece, as small then as possible, think nothing bad. Yeah. 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 Keeping yourself as small as possible um, in order to protect yourself, mm -hmm. because if you're still in, you know, sometimes you're still in like PTSD mode and that, that, that time where you have to protect yourself from some kind of harm, whether it's still there or not. Um, and uh, it's just, um, I've definitely grown throughout the years. And I actually not too long ago, um, I, you know, I tend to diminish myself a lot, which a lot of people that have trauma do. And um, a, a while ago, I said something or did something that kind of diminished myself. And there was this little voice in my head that said, you're not in your mother's kitchen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I thought, where, where has this thought been my whole life? Yeah. <laughs> um, because it was true. And, and this happened the same time I was reading the book. So I don't know if there's a connection mm. there. But that, you know, you, you hopefully through your work, whatever healing process you're going through, you realize that you don't, you don't have to be that small, that small mm -hmm. child anymore. You, you can live your life and not be afraid. And, and yeah. even though at times it seems impossible because you've been living your life in a certain way to not get hurt and not seem vulnerable. But then for me, it's like, again, with the eating, there's a whole world of people out there that <laughs> don't experience this. And again, I just wanted to be a part of that. So it's been just a tremendous way to, to heal from my trauma. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, that's so, that's so awesome. Um, yeah, one of the quotes that I remember, and I'll probably remember this for the rest of my life, is that... Um, and I forget when the book was written and, and when this quote might have been, and what statistics this might have been based on or from what time. Mm -hmm. But um, he said that for every soldier that comes home from war with PTSD mm -hmm. and children 
are developing PTSD growing up in their homes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, that like completely blew me away and resonated at the same time. Right. And yeah. um, I remember, I feel like there's been several versions of this realization for me, but mm -hmm. um I, you know, even just something fun, like I, I like to play pickleball, um, yeah. which is like a smaller, faster version of doubles tennis. But mm -hmm. um, so I've played that the last um, five years and it's been a good opportunity for me to practice some of this stuff. Cause like for most people, they wouldn't have PTSD playing a sport, but <laughs> right. um, uh, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, if you grew up with a uh, controlling, angry dad uh, for 22 years and couldn't leave the home for that mm -hmm. whole time um, and were micromanaged uh, about everything, um, yeah. then just an enthusiastic teammate who is super competitive, who gets frustrated every time they don't score a point, it yeah. can trigger PTSD. <laughs> so, sure. um, yeah. yeah. And so, um, but even just like if, I noticed that whenever I made a mistake or mm -hmm. didn't do the brilliant thing I was attempting to do, um, right. I felt like I'd done something wrong. And I, mm -hmm. it took me a while to realize uh, that that was what it was happening. It was like any, any imperfection, anything less than what was ideal or optimistic right. or perfect, I, it was my fault and I had done something wrong and people were going to be mad at me and I was in trouble and, <laughs> and all of these huge emotions <laughs> Yeah. for, yeah. you know, it was just a, a wrong touch and a, <laughs> you know, it was stupid. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. And so I'm like realizing, whoa, this is what I'm experiencing. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I um, started saying to myself was don't shrink. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, no, I can stand up tall. I can yeah. remember that I'm strong and fast and I'm a good athlete and I'm good at the right. sport and I don't have to shrink because right. early on, as I was playing the game, um, I would, it would like, I, as soon as something like that happened, I would end up playing all the rest of the games from that attitude of like, mm -hmm. I got to work really, 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 really hard to try to, uh, redeem myself from right. whatever, horrible thing yeah. <laughs> that I've done playing this fun game. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, but that, I mean, even just that one little phrase, don't shrink, mm -hmm. um, helped me like kind of shake that off. Remember, wait, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm awesome. I'm right. playing a game and it's fun and I don't have to, um, right be uh consumed by this feeling that is related to things that happened a long time ago right yeah yeah i still have that like i i've always been very blessed to work in places that um where my supervisor director has um been kind of the opposite personality of me mm -hmm. whereas you know for me if i made a mistake at work it was like I'm going to get fired. I'm the worst person ever. Why do I keep making mistakes? I mean, it's just this, um, um, what's the word for it? The rumination of this, which was what was probably a very small minor mistake. But to me, because I made this mistake, it was so big and it somehow related to my worth. And, and, um, but then you know, I would talk to my boss or whatever, and they'd say, I, you don't need, this is just a, this wasn't a big deal. And for me, it was a big deal, yeah. but, um, yeah, I, because I, I grew up also in a home that we were just heavily criticized all the time. And, um, along with like the, I think a lot of my hypervigilance still comes from the domestic violence that was in our house. And, um, because you're always like on alert and you yeah. live your life being on alert mm -hmm. and you don't want to make mistakes because you know who knows what's going to happen usually something bad yeah and um but now i've i've kind of now mostly because of where i work it's like 
oh, you know, nobody died. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good, good, uh, good monitor, good, good feedback. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just, there goes Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> Spot of the coyote? Yeah, I think so. Nice. They have to fix it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, he just, um, okay. <laughs> no coyote. <laughs> um, but yeah, and just realizing that everybody, I mean, you always hear the phrase, everybody always says it, everybody makes mistakes. But if you grow up with trauma, it's like, well, no, I don't make mistakes because, right. you know, the whole yeah. world's going to fall apart. My world's going to fall apart if I make mistakes. Yep. And um, whereas the rest of the world um, doesn't have to operate that way. And I think the book really points that out and they make that clear distinction between somebody who's experienced trauma and the way they look at hardships and even mistakes, even, you know, bigger mistakes and how they handle that compared to somebody that didn't experience trauma and how for them they can they realize their mistake and they they can move on mm -hmm. and they don't they don't attach the mistake to their their person basically mm -hmm. and their worth it's just right. a mistake they made and it doesn't make them a bad person at all yeah so yeah so i think the book really did well with that and I think any any reader um, that had experienced trauma hopefully will see that in the book that there actually is another way to live you can you can live a different way than your trauma person I don't know how else to say that but yeah totally there's just another there's another way to live and to yeah. operate and, and and then that leads to people enjoying life and um yeah so the book was really great at doing that that's cool that's really cool yeah uh something along those lines as far as like releasing perfection and and mm -hmm. just you know allowing yourself to live and, and kind of like when you had that dessert moment and yeah. realized you know i guess i could have dessert because i ran 10 miles and then yeah. your neighbor was like i can have dessert and i didn't run that. <laughs> like i can yeah. do whatever i want <laughs> Uh, right. yeah. and, um, and, you know, I just have to say, uh, because I'm a, a trainer and all this stuff, like I have looked into this and there's physiological benefit to pleasure. Right. And right. so, um, so if, if you're constantly like micromanaging your calorie burned versus your dessert intake, mm -hmm. um, you know, be, even being obsessed about it and like being, you know, Part, partly guilty that uh, yeah. that you're in you're having something right is is not good for your health right so like if yeah. you're going to have something choose to have it and choose to really relish and enjoy having right. it yeah. uh, because there is benefit to that um yeah where um if you are feeling guilty and shame and and all those things th those emotions just by themselves are not good for your health mm -hmm. so right. um yeah <laughs> Um, so combining that with, um, all the sugar you're taking in, probably not a good combo, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, uh, but enjoying that and, um, and something that, uh, I recently listened to, uh, complex PTSD by Pete mm -hmm. Walker. And, um, uh, that was another really amazing book, really helpful oh, book. Yeah. Another one that's really challenging to kind of get all the way through, but, so validating and so like a lot of really good tools mm -hmm. and um and he was actually explaining this concept from another therapist or psychologist i i don't remember um but he talked about the idea of good enough mm -hmm. and and uh, what i love about pete walker is that he experienced some trauma as a kid and so he's like not only sharing his client practice and um giving examples from clients anonymously, but um, giving examples from his own life too, because uh, he's yeah. processed through all, all bunch of stuff. Yeah. And, um, but the idea that like, if a trauma survivor doesn't actively look at the perfectionism, 
then then they can continue to traumatize themselves mm -hmm. by the expectations that they have of life right. and of their performance and of um, like they they have to have you know a million credentials to be qualified to speak or right. um, yeah. they um, like need something uh, like a, a perfect spouse or like all of these things and they could just carry on with this unrealistic expectation of everything that's mm -hmm. in their life and um, and miss out on enjoying life. And so, right. so this concept of doing a good enough job, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, having good enough employment, uh, having a yeah. good enough home, having a good enough relationship, uh, having a good enough car, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, having a good enough vacation, you know, right. yeah. <laughs> all yeah. these things. I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, that was like, that was kind of mind blowing as I was listening to him talk about that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, any, uh, any ways that you have seen that or practiced that? Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'd like to, think I'm pretty creative. I mean, I love creating things, whether it's writing or, you know, whatever it is. And um, one kind of lesson I learned was that um, things don't have to be perfect for them to be good. And um, I learned this, uh, I used to work for a place called the ABC House, which is the Child Abuse Assessment Center. And um, I, I did a lot of like their outreach materials and, and you know, posters and a lot of public speaking and, and all of that. And, um, you know, when you're speaking in front of an audience, you feel like you need to get everything perfect yeah. and be perfect. And then at some point I realized they're not expecting me to be perfect. Mm -hmm. they, they, and I'm sure if you're in an audience, you realize, um, depending on the topic, but you want to connect with the speaker in some way mm -hmm. and that the information they're giving is, is good enough. I mean, you know, you're not expecting them to be perfect. Right. And I was always like that growing up. I, I had to have everything perfect. And if it's not perfect, mm -hmm. then it's no good and yeah. not worth doing if it's not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know, over time, I, I think I honestly, I learned the biggest lesson when I worked with a lot of um, college interns. Um, they'd kind of be like my assistant or, or whatever. I'd help them with projects and things. And, um, you know, it's interesting. They, one in particular I can think of, she was just confident and um, just I, I, I just admired her because she wasn't afraid to just be herself. And she, I guess, taught me the lesson of being good enough mm. because I would just fret over something I was creating and she'd say, well, look, why don't we try it this way? It'll be good. And, and, um, mm. and it usually worked out really well, <laughs> of wow. course. Um, but yeah, I think when you grow up with trauma, you, if it's just like, if it's a constant battle in your childhood, you, you think to yourself that you're just not good enough because if you were good enough, if you were the best, then all of this stuff wouldn't be happening. For some reason, you know, children take on the responsibility of what the adults are doing yeah. and, or what they're not doing. And so you always think, I'm just not good enough right because otherwise this stuff wouldn't be happening yeah and then as you heal like you were just talking about as you heal with your ptsd and and all of that you realize that being good enough is is pretty good <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah that's kind of a roundabout way but yeah yeah that's cool yeah no i i remember um seeing that as well mm -hmm. people that were younger way less qualified way less experienced and they're just super confident. I'm like, right. what the heck? How'd you get yeah. that? Uh, <laughs> and and yet, um, that's awesome. It's like mm -hmm. that's that's how it should be. Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 So one of the other quotes that um, I love from the book is our capacity to destroy one another is matched by our capacity to heal one another. Mm -hmm. Restoring relationships in community is central to restoring well-being. Mm -hmm. And right. that is something that has kind of struck me in a profound way in a lot of different seasons and areas of my life. Mm -hmm. Because, and even just observing others, you know, um, someone is uh, molested or sexually assaulted, and then there's like a whole investigation and and then there's like new rules put in place so that people are not uh, mm -hmm. near each other anymore or touching or, or right. you know, whatever. And, and so then there's like a, a traumatic experience mm -hmm. and then we make it more traumatic by like, okay, no connection. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. And, um, and even, um, and like there may be different views on this, but I remember like it struck me that like none of the teachers at a certain school were supposed to be Facebook friends with any of the mm -hmm. students. And I know mm -hmm. that that was meant for like protection. Right. But like yeah. if there aren't positive adult role models that can be trusted to interact with kids. Yeah. Then like, what kind of world is this? Right. Yeah. And, and, um, and so like there is, so much uh, communication and connection that happens through touch. We are wired for uh, mm -hmm. community, for human interaction, for human touch. And there's like so many physiological healing things that happen uh, right. when we have all of that. Yeah. Um, and yet as a society and as a culture, it's kind of like either having sex and, uh, <laughs> Uh, like being promiscuous or in a relationship or you right. don't touch people and you don't connect with <laughs> right. people and you don't have, you know, right. you know, close friendships or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, there's kind of, there's kind of this real extreme and we don't, we haven't um, normalized healthy closeness right. in our communities. Yeah. 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 Touch, touch was a, a very, um, difficult part for me. Um, growing up, there wasn't a lot of, um, aside from the sexual abuse, there was no uh, other type of physical contact. Um, not that I remember anyway, um, which is one thing I think when I first started reading the book, I told you, I said, I, I feel more than I remember. Yeah. And, wow. um, which was like the first thought I got from, I don't know, the first 20 pages of the book, um, because she was talking a lot about memory and um, how those kind of surface in different ways. And, um, but talking about physical touch and how rewarding it can be and how healthy it can be, um, because I grew up thinking, <laughs> I grew up thinking that touch was was bad, that it always meant um, some kind of ulterior motive or that um, you couldn't trust it. You definitely couldn't trust it because one thing could lead to another and then eventually you're being traumatized again. Right. And so, um, but I, I, I have this cool little story of in, in high school, I lived with um, my math teacher and my health teacher mm, yes. um, they were married and and um, I won't go into how I ended up living with them but they basically uh, took me in at a time in my life I was I was it was a my junior year in high school and um, I lived with them and they it was so strange <laughs> living there because um they had a son who was five years old and I used to watch them interact with their son. And there were like, like we did these family hugs and, um, and there were other hugs and just like healthy touch that 
families do, that healthy families do. And it, at first I was like, oh, you know, get away from me, don't touch me. Yeah. And, um, but eventually I learned that there, there were ways to actually touch each other and hold each other and, um, and in such a comforting way um, that uh, it, it was so foreign to me at first, but after a year of living with them, um, and, and they were also the first time I experienced what healthy boundaries were. And, uh, and cause they had like these rules for the house and stuff like that. And, um, everybody was respected and, um, oh, it was just an amazing experience, but I learned, I learned so much about healthy relationships and, um, just being together and having that small, healthy family and how rewarding that is. So yeah, um, that's amazing. Yeah, for sure. It's so yeah. beautiful and, and miraculous that you mm -hmm. had that experience, yeah. especially at that time in your life. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just, I call them my parents now. Um, and they call me their adopted daughter. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, but it was the first time in my life I ever, I didn't know what validation was at the time, but now looking back, <clears throat> that's exactly what it was. <laughs> Hi, Oliver. <laughs> Giving you some validation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was my first time ever really experiencing being validated and even simple things like um, just, basic what parents do to care for their children. Like if it's a rainy day, you make sure your child has a, a jacket. Yeah. And, um, and I just, little things like that, I just was not used to. And I remember one night, um, obviously they were teachers, so homework was very important. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. And uh, in one week, there were two after school events um, that would have gone into later in the evening. And uh, so it would have compromised, you know, homework time. And um, so there were two after school events and, and they sat me down at the kitchen table and they talked about the pros and cons of missing homework and enjoying these activities. And basically they, they led me to choosing one over the other. And, but when they were doing that, I was thinking, you know, why do they like, why do you care? Mm. I, I don't understand. Like, why is this, why does it matter? Why do I matter? And, wow. um, but I did, you know, and it did matter. Mm. And, um, and, uh, but I, I remember that like, so and anytime I talk about my parents, um, that's one of the stories that always wow. comes to mind because it was such a mm. kind of a turning point in, what it felt like to be a child with parents that actually cared about you. Yeah, that's so cool. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And they're probably wanting to guide you, but in a way that didn't feel super controlling. Right. So they're probably being feeling anxious about that. And yet <laughs> you were like, whoa, they actually care about me. Right. And yeah. I, um, I value, I'm valuable mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. flashing back to the perfection concept and mm -hmm. um, how easy it is to kind of carry that on into adult life if it hasn't been looked at. This quote, I don't know who said it, uh, if, if anyone knows, but um, I've learned that my brokenness is far greater, a far greater bridge to other people than my pretend wholeness ever mm -hmm. will be. Mm hmm. And I yeah. feel like that is the thing that you were talking about, you know, listening to a speaker and, you know, some speakers can be very well put together, mm -hmm. very polished, very impressive. Right. But you don't feel connected to them. Right. You feel intimidated yeah. by them. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, there isn't a bridge. And, um, and so I was actually just thinking about that when we were talking earlier, because my my perfectionism and my tendency even maybe just a few years ago would have felt like putting off this conversation until I reread the book oh yeah or recently and took a uh taken more notes 
so uh-huh. I could have you know more things to contribute. But mm-hmm. I just kept reminding myself, hey, she's reading it. I'll remember a few things. Um, yeah, we'll have a good conversation. It's going to be beneficial. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, that's I don't have to be perfect. It's good enough. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I don't remember everything I read in the book anyways. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And it would take too like, long. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they might as well read could. the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think, and I never even considered that to be an issue anyway, because um, I think you and I have just talked about what's in the book anyway. Mm-hmm. And it was more important just talking about what we learned from the book rather than, I mean, I, I just learned a lot of lessons from the book and whether I read the whole thing or not, I think yeah. the important part is what did you get out of the book with totally. what you read yeah. and what do you remember? Um, I think that's what's important. And I think any author would, you know, an author is not going to grill you on, Oh, what did I, what did I say on page 50? third line you know yeah exactly yeah how did you feel about the book and you know we we remember our feelings more than we're going to remember some detail that you know like the whole section with the brain chemistry and all of that Mm -hmm. I don't have a science brain and so that part was really hard so it was like okay um we'll just skip this part in the video because I don't know Yeah, for sure yeah (laughs) I want answers, Patty. No. <laughs> There's something about the amygdala and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that actually reminds me because like um, uh, some of the uh, experts and professionals I follow on YouTube uh, have done a really good job of uh, kind of explaining the fight or flight mm-hmm. uh, response and yeah. freeze and how uh, we used to think of like sympathetic as the fight or flight and the parasympathetic as the rest and digest, Mm -hmm. but the parasympathetic also houses is the, like the home nervous system for freeze. So um, parasympathetic is like governing the, the immobile responses, the Mm -hmm. rest and digest, the safe and social um, and the freeze where mm-hmm. the sympathetic is the active responses, the fighting or the fleeing. Right. And, right. And, um, and so that was like that, that kind of was really helpful for me to understand um, mm-hmm. because I did spend a lot of my childhood in freeze. Response, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Where I couldn't think I couldn't, um, I couldn't uh, move the way I wanted to. And then uh, one of the ladies, uh, Irene Lyon, Dr. Irene Lyon, on YouTube uh, talks about functional freeze mm-hmm. and that's where you're pretty much frozen on the inside but you can do enough to look like you're operating fine right yeah and so yeah. like you can give a presentation or you can talk to somebody or you can agree with someone or you can perform a task and mm-hmm. you're absolutely in freeze state but you're able to function and look like you're mm-hmm. okay so that your abusers will leave you alone right um, yeah which is crazy, but, um, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so all of, all of that stuff, like, if it has practical application, you'll remember it, mm-hmm. but, you know, right. if, if it's just about remembering anatomy and physiology, like, that's, right. you know, not going to be, yeah, something you have to keep you have to right. grasp on, so, yeah, <laughs> <Right>. yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think, I think I wrote, Oh, I, I think I told you about, I guess, going back to the book, kind of what um, talking about memories. And I think one of the things that really stood out was the fact that because um, I haven't always trusted what I remember um, because some things were so horrible. You're kind of like, no, I'm probably getting that wrong. That yeah, couldn't have happened. Sure. And the author was talking about how memories are, they don't follow this linear path. And in fact, they're, they can be quite fragmented. And um, part of the process of healing is kind of putting those pieces back together so that then you can, it can make sense. And then you can kind of move on. Um, But that's one thing the book did was like, 
and, and why I had to stop reading at certain points was it would bring up certain memories and I'm like, okay, uh, I need to take a little rest here and figure this out. And, um, but yeah, so you're right. It's just the parts that resonate best with us are what we were, what we are going to remember, um, more than actual just details of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, um, I know that, uh, running and, um, various health habits are, uh, some things that have helped you uh, kind of nourish and heal and soothe mm -hmm. yourself at, on a kind of maintenance routine. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what about in moments where you're suddenly triggered um, yeah. or there's a flashback or something and your body is in a stress state, fight or flight or freeze? Um, yeah. Have you found anything um, to kind of, um, soothe your way out of that? Well, I think one of the first things I do is I focus on my breathing. Mm -hmm. And, um, because if, if I'm experiencing a flashback, um, then, you know, you're like, I think even in the book, they talk about it, but your respiration just increases and your heart is just racing. And, um, so if I can, if I can recognize, what's happening. And so I'll start with deep breathing and just kind of try and calm myself down. And, um, uh, like, um, not too long ago, I I'd say about three months ago, um, I was driving in my car and this song comes on the radio. And this particular song is a huge trigger for me. And, um, normally it doesn't play on the radio, so I don't, typically have to worry about it, but I just happened to change stations and the song came on. Luckily I was close to my house. So I was sitting in my car and I was just stuck in that moment that that song brought me back to wow. as a small child. And, um, I was frozen in my car. I was just sitting there. And so I started with my breathing. I thought, okay, it's just a song. It's on the radio. You're not, again, I'm not in my mother's kitchen. Yeah. Um, you're in wow. your car. There's nothing. It's just, you have to reassure yourself that you're not in your memory. You're, right. you're in present time. And um, so I work on my breathing. And then there was this little, I was sitting in my car and I was just like frozen. And this little voice is like, okay, you just need to get out of your car. Just just get out of your car. You can walk around outside and kind of recalibrate in a way. And, um, I mean, it still happens to this, to this day I have triggers and, um, sometimes my response is like rage. I'll feel just this incredible rage. And then other times I'm just frozen and, mm -hmm. and want to escape. <laughs> yeah. So what about you? How do you yeah. handle it? So yeah, the breathing has been um, huge for me as well. And, um, I noticed that most of the time I actually stop breathing. So mm. I, my tendency, because it's more of the freeze state rather than the mm. fight or flight, um, right. um, it's, um, like, uh, everything slows down. Like I just stop yeah. right. moving. Yeah. And yeah. so, so yeah, reactivating the breathing, <laughs> taking deep, yeah. slow breaths, which I think it's awesome, like that you are a runner because, um, you know, that deep, slow breathing mm -hmm. is like such an important part for endurance. Right. Um, yeah. So that's great training for <laughs> all the yeah. moments that you need it for. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in my unique situation, I had um, hypothyroid, hypoadrenia, um, mm -hmm. extreme fatigue, inability to build muscle. And I actually, it was better for me not to do cardio uh -huh. because I was like completely draining my system mm -hmm. of energy all the time. So the right. thyroid was at its limit. The adrenals were at the limit and anything could trigger a, a spike and I would just like completely drain. So um, I had to focus on more of the uh, slow, gentle strength training, kind of turn it into oh. a meditative thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that was, I mean, I practiced breathing with that as well. Um, yeah. but the slowing down, 
um, and focusing and uh, being in my body and all those things were helpful. But, um, but I think along with the, like holding my breath and kind of freezing in that way, um, I have always been very stiff. And you talked about earlier, like um, kind of being small, trying to not be noticed, be as, as uh, uh, like draw as little as attention as possible. Right. And, yeah. um, and so that was always a part of it too, was like, uh, we would get in trouble for even laughing, like uh, mm-hmm. being silly or moving in funny ways or dancing or whatever, any of those things that yeah. got in big trouble for. So, um, so I just like, and then I went straight from that world for 22 years, right into the Marines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so standing straight and tall, not moving, not, you know, not being, you know, silly with my body and free with my body and, and those kinds yeah. of things are just kind of natural. Yeah. And, um, and so movement is something that has helped, like even just kind of like rolling my head around, shaking my arms, yeah, rolling my shoulders, right. like kind of shaking my legs out, like yeah, all of those things. Um, it's amazing uh, that it's like a neural uh, and physical reset. Right. Kind of yeah. like sh- shakes off the bad juju, like not yeah. even like <laughs> right. just imaginary, but like w- literally uh, yeah. it does. And, um, and so, yeah, moving, um, if you've ever uh, taken a tapping class, uh, not tap dancing, but like, um, right. the, uh, the tapping and yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. I think there was a, yeah, there so, was something on your Yeah. Head. So like different points. So like at the top of the head, yeah. Uh, right at the yeah. middle of the eyebrows, um, right at the side of the eyes, the ocular nerve, yeah. um, under the nose, right at the crease of the chin, uh, uh-huh. inside the collarbones, and um, and then the side of the hand. Yeah, I was going to say, there's something with the hands. Yeah. Each, each thumb, each finger, um, and then the wrists yeah. together, and under the armpits. So um, <laughs> I didn't know about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you can kind of like self soothe mm-hmm. uh, with a kind of a conversation about all the things that you're feeling and then all the things that you want and then the things that you want to feel. Um, and, and if you're doing the, and tapping, um, it really helps calm the nervous system. And the reason that works as I'm learning more about the nervous system and all of that is that though the fight or flight and the freeze are all part of the old brain. So very, very primal aspects of who we are. Right. So it's not something you can logic yourself out of. Right. Uh, yeah. It is actually uh, physiological and like you have to connect with your body. So that's why right. breathing helps. That's primal. That's physiological. The shaking and the moving helps. Yeah. Um, the tapping helps like even just, um, another technique was just, just bone tapping. So mm-hmm. like, uh, hitting your sternum, kind of like slapping your arms, yeah. uh, slapping your hands, slapping your legs, just kind of like reconnecting your attention to right. your physical body. And yeah. so that's been helpful for me as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it seems unsophisticated and yet it's, yeah. Very real, very helpful. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think um, anytime I'm in a long race um, or doing a long run, it's like I'm, I'm almost, I'm always monitoring how my body feels and to try and stay connected. If something starts hurting, I'll like, okay, if I shift this, then this will stop hurting or, you know, it's just constantly being in tune with my body, but in a different way than what I talked about earlier about eating disorders. Right. It's more of a, like, let's take care of my it's body. A, yeah. During- Caring focus versus a judging focus. In it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and it's kind of like waking yourself up um, when you're frozen. It's like, no, I'm still here. 
-hmm. You're kind of validating that you're a person and you're still here. You exist yeah. 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 and you have a right to exist. And um, I can kind of reframe where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the good. tapping I learned about when I um, worked at the child abuse assessment center, because one of the therapists there used that often for kids who had been traumatized. So, Great. and it was really, really successful. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for um, getting together and uh, talking about this. Yeah. And uh, I love uh, uh, that we were kind of keeping in touch the whole time you were going through it. And, yeah. <laughs> um, kind yeah. of leading up to this conversation. So that's really good. So yeah. the book is uh, The Body Keeps the Score mm -hmm. by uh, Bessel van de Kirk. Yes. And, good uh, job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so if people want to find you or follow you, um, what's the best place for them to do that? Um, well, I think I'm on Instagram. I'm ultra runner or ultra slow runner on Instagram. And I think I'm, let me, let me double check that real quick because <laughs> I'm not a social media um, expert really. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's good. Uh, yeah, I'm ultra slow runner, all one word, .com on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And um, it was supposed to be about running, but there's more photos of my dog, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. The, guy, the dog you saw in the video. Yeah. And then on, face, on Facebook, I'm actually Anna Grace Hopkins. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just changed that for fun. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, and then uh, my YouTube channel is also ultraslowrunner.com. Perfect. Um, usually you just have to Google Bigfoot. Oh. Bigfoot 40 miler and my video will pop up. So oh, nice. Okay. There aren't very many videos of Bigfoot. Nice. So okay. Mine will pop up there on yeah. ultraslowrunner.com. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Ultra slow runner. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, um, so yeah, this will... Um, uh, show up on my YouTube channel, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll share it on Facebook and, uh, cool. uh, uh reference it on Instagram. So, okay. um, yeah. So thank you again and uh, look forward to hopefully another conversation sometime soon. Yeah. And maybe seeing you in person someday. <laughs> yeah, I know. Totally. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. thank you. So, all right. Bye Kyler. Bye.